Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Philips Securities Research Morning Call. For today, we have quite a lot of stock counter updates as well as results, some technical analysis, as well as a uh, sector outlook for Fang and Monthly, Singapore Banking Monthly, as well as Singapore Weekly. So without further ado, let me help a time to Jonathan to get started on the Fang and Monthly. Thank you. Thanks, Zane. And good morning, everyone. Yeah, so I was, I'll be giving our uh, monthly update for the Fang M uh, for October. Next slide, please. Overall, for the Fang M, it actually outperformed the overall market. Uh, you know, it was up 1.6% for October compared to the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, uh, both down slightly more than 2%. Uh, in, in terms of the individual counters, uh, Netflix and Microsoft were the biggest gainers after you know they issued, uh, I guess, blowout um uh, uh, results on, on revenue and earnings that actually blew our estimates, uh, while Google was the biggest loser that was down about 6%, uh, mainly due to some uh, disappointing cloud uh, uh, growth, uh, I guess, news and, and outlook. Uh, in terms of the, you know, Fang M for the month, overall, the earnings growth was the key highlight. Uh, at the same time, their yeah, forward uh, PE valuations also remain fairly attractive and minus one standard deviation away from its 10-year average. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a snapshot of you know how each company did in terms of revenue as well as adjusted earnings. Um, uh, it, in general, you know revenue growth continued to accelerate as a whole for for the group of companies, eight uh, percent year on year for the third quarter versus you know, about seven percent year on year in the second quarter. So it's a slight reacceleration. Uh, obviously, uh, most of this is boosted by um, you know, your digital advertising recovery as well as uh, some resilient e-commerce demand. And it also dragged a little bit by by Apple as um, uh, I guess uh, sales of, of a lot of hardware, uh, tech hardware, uh, still remain fairly weak. Uh, in terms of earnings growth, this was the big standout. You know, earnings grew almost forty five percent year on year, which is quite significant. I believe last quarter, uh, earnings growth was only about twenty plus percent. So, so a very significant jump in in earnings growth. Um, uh, the biggest reason obviously is because most of these companies are actually starting to feel the the full effects of uh, its cost cutting efforts. Um, so over I guess the last uh, nine to twelve months, uh, as many of these companies have begun like cutting uh, headcount and, and cutting their their own infrastructure and facilities, they did actually incur a lot of uh, costs related to this. Uh, for example, like if you are terminating leases or if you're, uh, there's a lot of like um remuneration or compensation, uh, kind of costs when when it comes to letting go of some of your your headcount. Uh, and so this is actually was already passed through, and and so what we're we're starting to see right now is, uh, much leaner companies. Um, they're they're able to kind of uh, benefit on the on their operating leverage um, while still kind of driving revenue growth. Uh, at the same time, you know, growth guidance for most of these companies was quite encouraging. Um, most of them were were uh, guided to revenue growth in like ten to twenty percent range, so quite significant growth for the fourth quarter of this uh com date, which is uh, coming up. Um, except for Apple, which remained fairly flat. Um, so Apple was was the main, I guess, disappointment. Uh, you know, even though iPhone sales were, were fairly resilient. Uh, they still expect a lot of downside from it, uh, a lot of drag from it. It's other ha hardware products like Apple, um, like it's Mac, it's iPad, uh, so as well as it's, it's uh, wearables. Um, moving to the individual counters, uh, some of the news, we won't go uh, too much in, in depth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for the most part, you know, Apple, they're starting to offer this ad free subscription uh, for Facebook. No, sorry, for, yeah, for Meta. Uh, they're starting to offer it, offer a ad free subscription for Facebook and Instagram. Uh, this is mainly in Europe, so they'll be charging about ten euros a month on web and thirteen euros a month on mobile. But essentially, this is some way of them uh, skirting some of their EU uh, data privacy regulations. So essentially, if you sign up for ad free subscriptions, then you have the option to say that you don't want, as a user, you don't want them to share any of your your data with uh, advertisers. Um. Aside from that, not much for, for Meta. For Alphabet, they're planning to start manufacturing um, of its uh, Pixel 8 phones in, in India. Uh, so they'll be partnering with both uh, domestic as well as in international manufacturers to kind of produce the phones there. Um, uh, two, two reasons for this. The first reason is obviously that they've diversified some of its supply chain away from China. Uh, and secondly, you know, India is a huge market for Google uh, given its growing middle class. So, so they're planning to you know, manufacture the phones there as well as start selling the phones there. Um, which you know should be because they're able to have 
a, a wide range range of, of prices for their phones. You know, they they should be able to capture quite a bit of the market share, uh, in India. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, not much news for Apple and Amazon either. Uh, either than the earnings, which I kind of spoke about a little bit just now. Uh, for Amazon, you know, earnings was was huge beat. Um, and this was mainly due to a few reasons. Uh, better logistics, so they were able to improve the efficiencies of their logistics, reducing the, the cost. Uh, at the same time, they, they, they are kind of easing cost pressures from, from uh, um, I guess, lower levels of inflation. Uh, so we talk about freight rates or rail rates, and this has kind of come down. So also reducing their cost on the top line uh, or, or for their, their, their cost of goods. Uh, at the same time, you know, they, they saw quite a strong uh, year-on-year growth in terms of uh, their advertising revenue. Uh, which is quite significant because advertising revenue in general is a lot uh, higher margin compared to the rest of the business, like uh, as, especially compared to its e-commerce business. Yeah. Uh, so that's all from my counters. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we have uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. For Microsoft, not much except for earnings, uh, which were in line with expectations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so so overall for the fam, we still remain over it. Uh, we think that earnings growth remains fairly strong. We think that they will continue to be strong going forward, especially uh, with the, the kind of recovery in digital advertising. Um, at, at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, you know, valuations remain fairly attractive uh, for, for most of the fam. Uh, I think o overall as a sector, it's still quite attractive um, uh, just because, you know, it is about one standard deviation away from its long-term average. So it's, 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 a, it's a decent... Uh, if you count it as a whole sector, you know it's a different, decent uh, opportunity to pick up some of these stocks. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, digital advertising continues to recover, but but tech hardware uh, demand still remains quite a drag. Um, this you know mainly comes from uh, Apple. Uh, so with that, I'll head, I'll move on to my next counter, which is C Limited. Uh, they issued their third quarter results, and we tattoo our, our report buying market share. Next slide, please. Uh, for C Limited. Uh, it was kind of a mixed bag. You know, revenue was, was roughly in line, um, but the net loss was kind of a disappointment for us. Um, we did expect you know, kind of a uh, more of a break even uh, uh, for for this quarter as well as next quarter and the fourth quarter. But but uh, the company actually it went back into the red after three quarters of profitability. The biggest reason for this was a, a surge in sales and marketing expenses because they started to ramp up uh, investments in its uh, Shopee or its e-commerce unit. Um, so they're starting to spend more money on its on live streaming as well as, uh, just more marketing because, uh, there is, you know, quite intense competition there from TikTok shop as well as, uh, you know, other traditional e-commerce players. At the same time, they're also starting to to, uh, try to penetrate deeper into you know, some of the markets that it's in, especially in Latin America, uh, and, and uh, Southeast Asia. You know, those those markets that are still you know developing. Uh, and have long runways to to, to grow, so that they're, they're, they're kind of turning the switch back from, you know, cutting costs to to spending more money, uh, and this has impacted their yeah, bottom line quite significantly. Uh, in terms of you know some of the outlook, um, we do expect spending to continue. Um, firstly, in the fourth in into the fourth quarter, uh, C actually mentioned that they will continue spending on Shopee, uh, but we do expect some sort of elevated levels to continue into twenty twenty four. Mainly because we don't think it'll just be a maybe two quarters. We think that it'll be more, um, you know, three to 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 four quarters of spending to try and uh, at least boost some boost some of the growth before they they taper off a little bit. Uh, and this should should place a little bit of downward pressure on their margins uh, moving forward, at least in the near term. Uh, however, we do think that that on the flip side, you know, what's expected to to expand margins would be their C money unit, uh, which is still growing well. You see, you know, revenue growth about thirty seven percent year year, so so quite uh, you know fairly strong growth. Um, and at the same time, uh, margins for C money is a lot bigger. You know, it's thirty four percent operating margins compared to, uh, Shopee, which is you know single digits. I guess for the quarter it's it's negative, but but uh, for the last few quarters it's been maybe a, a low to mid single digits, uh, uh, in terms of margin. So so not not that significant. Uh, so we think that you know as C money continues to grow, it'll, it'll be the main main contributor to, uh, margin expansion in the mid. Uh, in terms of our valuations, we actually cut our 2023 and 2024 EBITDA by 19% and 16%, uh, meaning to reflect the, the ramp up in uh, Shopee investment. Um, but however, we, we still maintain a buy because we still think that uh, C is, is well position, positioned to capture a lot of the e-commerce growth, uh, especially in emerging markets, mainly due to their scale uh, as well as the infrastructure that they've built up over the last few years. 
uh, we, we reduced our target price from 87 US dollars to 61 uh, US dollars. So that's all for me. I'll hand it over to Abrish uh, for, for Block. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. So moving on to Block's third quarter results. Next slide, please. So Block is basically a fintech company, and it operates through uh, two business segments. First one, which is Cash App. So this particular segment, it uh, offers consumer banking services like the users, they can transfer money transfers to another uh, Cash App user, as well as it provides a debit card and also savings feature. And uh, through Cash App, the users, they can also invest in stocks and Bitcoin. And the second segment, which is Square. So this particular segment, it helps merchants to uh, to uh, process the payments for their sales. And also it provides hardwares wherein uh, uh, their uh, hardwares for point of sale solutions like uh, the card reader wherein they can uh, uh, swipe in the, the cards to receive payments. So uh, overall, uh, the uh, the results were in line with our uh, expectations. The revenue was in line. However, uh, by, while the earnings, it was ahead mainly because of higher operating, uh, operating leverage. So uh, moving on to the positives, Block it specifically focuses on gross profit instead of revenue as a key metric, mainly because uh, it's Bitcoin revenue, it's a lower margin business. So uh, the cash up gross profit, it grew by about 27% year over year. And this was mainly because of uh, the 12% growth in its monthly cash up monthly users, transacting users, which reached about 55 million. And also uh, there was highly uh, high engagement uh, for example, uh, out of the 20, 55 million, nearly 22 million had uh, uh, had already subscribed for that debit card. And secondly, uh, the company is focusing on improving its earnings. For instance, like its operating expenses for third quarter of 2023, it grew by about 18% as compared to the 40% range in, uh, throughout 2022. And this was mainly because the company, it has been focusing on cost-cutting initiatives. Like for instance, uh, the company, said that it currently has about 13,000 employees headcount growth and it plans to reduce it to about 12,000 by the end of next year. And uh, it's also cutting down on its uh, uh, infrastructure and also uh, on uh, lowering on its uh, uh, sales and marketing expenses. So moving on to the outlook, the gross payment volume on the Square platform, uh, it has been declining and for the third quarter, it grew for about 11% compared to the 20% range the previous year. And this was mainly because of the lower consumer spending, uh, lower consumer discretionary spending, and the lower spending it particularly came into the food and beverages sector, and also the retail categories witnessed lower spend, lower spending. In terms of outlook, uh, the company uh, it expects a consolidated gross profit growth of about 90%, and this should be again mainly driven by its cash up segment. And the square segment, the company highlighted that in October, it uh, witnessed further deterioration in the consumer spending and uh, particularly into the uh, food and beverages industry. And uh, the company, it also provided outlook for the FY24, wherein it expects to be uh, profitable on a gap operating income basis. And it expects its adjusted EBITDA to grow by about 44%. And this was mainly because of mainly because of higher operating leverage at, through the cost-cutting initiatives. In terms of uh, valuations, we maintain our buy recommendation and we uh, increased our target price to 85 from $83, mainly because we increased our adjusted pay pat me by about 15% due to uh, lower expenses. And uh, overall for our block, uh, we believe that it's well positioned to benefit mainly because it's uh, uh, it mainly targets, its, ta mainly targets the underbanked population which don't have access to a bank account or consumer banking services, which they don't have. So through uh, its uh, various uh, banking services, it mainly targets the underbank population. And also through the resurgence in in the consumer spending, the block should come continue to benefit from that. So uh, that's all for me. I would now like to pass on to Glenn for DBS. Thanks, Ambrish. Yep. So for DBS, they released their third quarter results. Uh, now moving on to the next slide. Yep. So for the third quarter 23 adjusted PME of 2.63 billion, it was slightly above our estimates, mainly due to higher net interest income, fee income, and other non-interest income, which was offset by higher allowances. The ninth month 23 adjusted PME is at 78% of our 
FY23 forecast. For their dividends, their third quarter 23 DPS was raised 14% year on year to 48 cents. So I'll move on to the positives. The first positive being that their net interest margins and net interest income continued to increase year on year, with the net interest income rising 16% year on year. This was mainly due to a 29 basis points net interest margin increase to 2.19%. So if you if you look at it quarter on quarter, it also rose about three basis points as interest rates continue to remain high. And this is despite their loans growth dipping to 2% year on year. And the loans growth decline was mainly due to a decline in customer and trade loans due to unattractive pricing, while the non-trade corporate loans were lower due to higher repayments. And uh, just to note, uh, the City Taiwan consolidation also contributed about $10 billion to loans. The second positive is that their fee income continued to grow. It rose 9% year on year and mainly from a broad-based growth across their wealth management, uh, credit card fees, as well as loan-related fees. But however, there was a decline in their investment banking fees due to slower capital market activities. But the third positive is that their other non-interest income rose 21% year-on-year, mainly due to an increase in net trading income from higher trading gains and an increase in treasury customer sales to both wealth, wealth management and corporate customers. For the negatives, the first negative is that their allowances was higher by 21% year-on-year, mainly due to higher specific provisions of $197 million, compared to $25 million in the, uh, in the previous year, in third quarter 22. And as such, their third quarter 23 credit costs, credit costs rose to 18 basis points, with the total with the nine-month credit costs at 11 basis points. And this rise in specific provisions was mainly due to the allowances being prudently taken for exposures linked to the recent money laundering case in Singapore. So the management did say that they have actually provisioned fully for, for all the, the sort of like the, the cases that are linked to this money laundering. So like, you know, for example, their, their house, uh, their, their property that they have, you know, they have provisioned it fully and you don't expect to get anything back. So for the second negative is that their current account savings accounts ratio or CASA ratio fell 12.5 percentage points year on year to 47.8%. So this was mainly due to the high interest rate environment as well as a continued move towards the fixed deposits. But nonetheless, if you look at their total customer deposits, it was flat year on year at 531 billion. For the outlook, um, I'll just jump straight to the, the, for the FY24 sort of guidance they provided. Because if you look at the FY23 guidance, they have sort of maintained it and they didn't really talk much about it. So the FY24 guidance they did guide for double-digit fee income growth, and this was mainly coming from wealth management and card fees. They also guided for stable net interest income as the higher net interest margins from the higher for longer rates will be offset slightly by lower loans growth. But to note that they did mention, you know, they do expect the rates to maintain at these levels until for the first half of FI24 and, you know, the possibility for it to dip in the second half of 24. So total allowances will also be normalized at 17 to 20 basis points of loans. And the most important thing was that for the PADME, they did say that it would be maintained at around the current levels in FY23. So as such, we maintain a buy with an unchanged target price of $41.60, and our FY23 estimates remain unchanged. We, as we do think that the continued growth in net interest margins from the higher for longer interest rates, as well as a recovery in fee income will sustain the earnings momentum for DBS. Moving on to OCBC. Yeah, thanks. So OCBC also released their third quarter earnings and the third quarter earnings of 1.81 billion was slightly above our estimates. It came from higher net interest income as well as higher fee income offset by lower insurance income and higher allowances. The nine-month 23 PEPME was at 77% of our FY23 forecast. For the positives, the first positive being that their net interest income grew 17% year-on-year, which was led by net interest margin improvement of 21 basis points to 2.27%. This is despite the loans growth dipping 2% year-on-year. The name expression was mainly driven by higher margins across the group's key markets. And OCBC has also increased their name guidance for FY23, and this is from the previous guidance of above 2.2 to around 2.25%. So for the second positive is that their fee income grew to the highest level in four quarters and it rose 2% year on year. And this was mainly due to growth in wealth management fees from increased customer activities and as well as from higher credit card fees. So furthermore, the group's wealth management income also grew 16% to 
to 1.12 billion, and this contributed to 33% of the group's total income in third quarter 23. For negatives, the first negative is that their insurance income fell 12%, mainly from an increase in medical claims, and this was partly compensated by the improved investment performance. For the second negative is that their total allowances also rose 19% year on year to 184 million, as their specific provisions grew to 222 million, which was partly partially offset by a GP right bank of 36 million. And this higher SP was from corporate accounts in various sectors and geographies all over ASEAN, and not to any specific account. So OCBC said that this was not just one big lump sum and they were just um, sort of uh, provisioning across different sectors and accounts. So they have also said that this is they do not see any systemic risk in all these increases. So this resultantly drove credit costs up by four basis points year on year to 17 basis points. The third point negative is that their current account savings accounts ratio also continued to fail to fall by 9.8 percentage points year on year to 46.3 percent due to the same reason that the, the high interest rate environment and a continued move towards fixed deposits. But their total deposit, customer deposits did increase 5% year on year to 369 billion, mainly from the strong growth in fixed deposits. For the outlook, um, we'll look at the so for the outlook, we see that the third quarter, uh, sorry, for the FY23 guidance, it was not really uh, it was not really changed, only with the slight in uptick in the in the NIM guidance. And for FY24, we do anticipate that the net interest income growth will be driven by stable NIMS as well as rising loans amid the stabilized rates, with fee income recovery boosting earnings. And OCBC is also our preferred pick among the three banks due to their attractive valuations and dividend yield of 6.6%, buffered by a well-capitalized 14.8% CT1 and fee income recovery from China's reopening. So as such, we maintain a buy recommendation with an unchanged target price of $14.96 and our FY23 estimates remain unchanged. So that's all I have for OCBC. I'll now move on to the Banking Monthly. Yeah, for the Banking Monthly, the first slide being the, the overview of the uh, third quarter 23 results for the three banks. So I just went through DBS and OCBC. I won't really uh, stay on this part for much. But if you look at the overview, you look at the two red boxes on the left in the table here, you can see that the net interest margins and net interest income has been positively affected by the high interest rates. So you can see that they have all uh, have double digit basis points increase in the net interest margins and you know the very healthy net interest income growth. And this has also resulted in the PETME increasing across the board for all the banks. But one of the key neg one of the uh, say negatives for the banks was that there was higher allowances across the board. And you know, it was due to multiple reasons. So for DBS, as I mentioned earlier, it was for the money laundering case. For OCBC, it was really just a broad-based increase in their specific provisions. And for UOB, it was a different story where they said that they actually rose the, they did a preemptive increase in their specific allowance to rebalance, as they rebalanced the collateral value in their US and Hong Kong China portfolio. But they did they did also say that this wasn't because the accounts were distressed or non-performing. It was more like a broad, just a just a preemptive prudent increase in their uh, specific provisions. So for the guidance for all three banks also remains relatively unchanged with names stable at around 2.1 to 2.25% and loans growth maintained at low to mid single digit. So now moving on to the next slide. Yeah, we look at the interest rates. The Singapore interest rates continued to uh, continued their gradual incline in October with the third month Sora up two basis points month on month to 3.72%. Uh, nonetheless, it was it rose 144 basis points year on year and it was also three basis points higher than the third quarter average of 3.69%. For the Hong Kong interest rates, it, it actually picked back up and it surged by 27 basis points month on month to 5.22%. This was reversing the total decline of 15 basis points in August and September combined. So this is the highest level that the three-month high ball has reached in 2023. And it improved by 126 basis points year on year and was 21 basis points higher than the third quarter average of 5.1%. Moving on to the loans growth. Uh, next slide, yes. Uh, so for the loans growth, the overall loans to Singapore residents uh, fell by 6.1% year on year in September to 788 billion. So this is a sort of a continued decline. And the last three, like from July to September, it has been declining at around 6%. So it's a, a bit higher than what it was previously. And this is below our estimate, mainly due to 
a rise in interest rates, something to be more fully felt by the consumers. For the business loans, it fell by 8.55% year on year in September, with the loans to the building and construction segment, which is the single largest business segment, falling 1.76% year on year, while the loans to manufacturing segment fell by 19.19% year on year. For the consumer loans, it was down 2.05%, as the dips in other segments were offset slightly by strong loan demand in the housing segment. So the housing segment, which was which has, which makes up about 70% of consumer lending, is the one of the only segments that has been showing sort of growth, and it grew by 1.09% year on year. For the total deposits and balances, it grew by 2.29% year on year in September to 1,784 billion, with the current account and savings accounts proportion uh, growing slightly at to 18.9%. So it was from 18.8% in the previous month. So this shows that the 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 you know, this CASA proportion has been flat around this 18.8 to 18.9% for the last couple of months. And it's good for the banks because as their funding costs have sort of stabilized for them, and we could see their names you know, maintaining at these current high levels if the interest rates are, are stable at, at the current levels. So uh, now moving on to the Hong Kong loans growth, which is on the right here. So the left side is uh, for the Singapore loans growth. I think there's a question. And the right will be Hong Kong loans growth. It's just a chart. So for the Hong Kong loans growth, it continued to decline and it fell by 4.89% year-on-year and it declined by 0.91% month-on-month in September. With the year-on-year -year loans decline in loans growth for September being higher than that in August and same for the month-on-month -month decline as well. So we have seen this continued decline for the Hong Kong loans growth for quite a while now. Moving on to the next slide for the SGX statistics. The SGX statistics, the SDAV, Fell for October fell 22% year on year to 897 million, with the, this being the second largest year on year decline in five months. While the DDAV fell 13% year on year, but, but was flat month on month at 1.07 million in October. The VIX, which is a market index that measures the implied volatility of the SP 500 index, so we use it to measure volatility, averaged 18.9 in October, and this was up from 15.2 in the previous month. And this is the highest that the VIX has reached since March 2023. For the top four equity index futures turnover, it saw a decline of 15.1% year on year in October, mainly due to the lower trading volumes of the FTSE China A50 index futures, as well as the MSCI index futures. Now, moving on to the next slide. Yep, I'll just go through some key uh, sort of uh, uh, key banking, Singapore banking highlights that happened in Singapore. Um, in October. So for October, I think there was just a few uh, uh, news. The main one was that Citigroup was actually expanding its wealth management presence in Singapore. And they will open two new wealth advisory hubs in Singapore. And also that the DBS and Citibank, I think it's quite well known, that they, they, were, they went back to normal after the outage hit both banks on, uh, on, that, on that day itself. And the, other, uh, the third one would be that the three local banks have actually said that they will um, allow customers to set up, set aside and lock up a certain amount of funds that cannot be transferred out of one's accounts digitally. So this is more of a step to guard against the rising scam cases. And they call it this uh, money lock. And you know, they, I think it's not very certain what, will, what it will be yet, but they're going to release it in somewhere time in this month. So, and the last one was that um, uh, several uh, cryptocurrency uh, sort of firms have actually received a full, Sing a full Singapore license to offer more digital asset payment services here. So, and it comes from MAS. I think there are one, there are, it, there are 14 companies and a few of them are like Coinbase, uh, Ripple, as well as uh, Revolut and Blockchain.com. Yeah, so that's all I have for the Singapore uh, banking. I'll now, uh, we remain positive and overweight on the banking sector. And yeah, that's all I have for the banking sector. I'll now hand it over to Peggy. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Good morning. I'll talk about SAT's uh, first half results. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, um, okay SAT's the results were in line, although the mix was somewhat disappointing. The food solutions, which was the core business of the group, remained in the red with an operating loss of about 0.9 million sing dollars despite the revenue uh, recovering back to the pre-COVID levels in, in the first half of uh, first half 20. Uh, the year end is, is in March. 
Okay, uh, WFS, which was uh, be began to be consolidated from April this year, contributed an operating profit of 73 million for the first time, or an operating margin of 5.1%. Uh, on, on the food side, the, the, the sets only operating margin was 0.3%. The the main reason why sets only revenue was was weak was also because of the decline in the non aviation food business that fell thirteen point eight percent. Um. Yeah. Okay. The so overall the 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 EBIT that they achieved in this first half is just barely enough to cover the interest expense for this period. Um. To, one thing to note is uh, because of the WFS lease a lot of their the uh the the properties that they they occupy so there's a, a part of the interest expense here also comprise the interest expense from uh lease liability accounting uh, ifrs 16 so we are, we are think about 70 million years from this uh, lease as, uh from this lease, lease liabilities still their interest cost average interest cost uh on that on the loan is about six percent i think that's the reason why they uh, last friday um um, uh, uh, propose a uh, insurance of a uh, three billion US dollar worth of uh to 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 issue three billion US dollars worth of debt or or uh perpetual securities. Uh, this these are these are debt with no fixed uh, repayment. Um, so to to try to bring down the in average interest cost to hopefully be uh, at four percent. Currently, our estimate is about uh. Uh, somewhat slightly below seven percent. Okay. Then the so with that the net profit is still a a, a negative of eight million in the first half of, of uh, FY twenty four. Uh, even though eighty nine percent of the flights have been at Changi Airport has been restored, and further growth from here is uh, is quite challenging for most of the airlines that we spoke to, uh, because of the uh, limited. A hangar capacity for them to bring back the the aircraft that has been uh, left idle and also manpower bottlenecks. The cargo volume uh, is turned positive year on year in terms of growth and for the in entire industry from August, but uh, most of this growth came from Asia Pacific. Uh, EU and North America are still uh, declining, though at a slower rate. And these two are the main markets of uh, WFS. Right. So, so with that, we think that the uh, slower aviation revenue grow will 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 uh we'll see slower aviation revenue grow from here because aircraft will find airlines will find it difficult to bring back uh, capacity at a faster rate. And on uh, in the in the recovery so far we we've seen a higher mix of budget carriers which the uh, and shorter haul routes these are the, the types of uh, business that that uh, does not benefit sets as much other than ground handling the the food portion they they have they are not competitive compared with the regional uh, kitchens that these aircraft also source their, their, their food supply from so the the higher associates profit we see here is likely going to be uh, mostly driven by ground handling and we think we think the the travel rebound in Asia will help. Okay. So the cargo recovery is, is still doubtful uh, in, in our opinion. And therefore, we, we cut our target price to $2.23 uh, to, to reflect this, um, this, this uh, impact of the slower growth going uh, forward from here. Uh, okay, that's, that's all for sets. Let, let me move on to the next company. Uh, can we turn the page, please? Yes, thanks. ST Engineering, uh, they had a third quarter update. Uh, they had a third quarter update for analysts. Okay, the there was no financial numbers other than the revenue and the order book. Uh, the third quarter numbers were uh, revenue was eight point seven percent higher. As you see, can tell from the table, the commercial aerospace uh was one leading the growth, and it's also because they they benefited from. Uh, a very tight hangar capacity in the in the industry uh, amidst the aircraft a aviation recovery and therefore they were also able to up their manpower rates the uh, urban solutions was uh, fairly uh, muted 
contributions from Chance Core, uh, congestion pricing project, but uh, SETCOM continue to stay weak. SETCOM is the satellite communication business. In the defense and public security side, there's a slight decline, uh, mainly because the US Marine was, was divested in, at the end of 2022. Without that, if we exclude that, the, the, the revenue growth is about 6%. And most of that, most of this growth right now is driven by cloud AI analytics and cybersecurity business. The total order book uh, secured in this third quarter at 2.2 billion is somewhat weaker than the average we see, about 4 to 5 billion every, every quarter. But uh, the management thinks that this, uh, this is just a matter of timing. The customer engagements are still on track. It's just that the, 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 the government, Probably because of this uh, geopolitical tension, this it's taken a bit, the, and the eruption of the of the crisis in Middle East has taken a bit longer for for customers to make decisions on the on the on the orders. Okay, next for for fourth quarter, they also expect to book gains from aircraft sale, which there was none in third quarter. So there, therefore, fourth quarter numbers are likely going to be stay much stronger than than from here. Uh, only negative from that meeting is that they guided a higher severance cost of seven million for SecCom uh, for the full year. Which, uh, they already booked two be two million uh, in first half. So there's another, there's another five million to go for second half. That will lead to a lower EBIT for for the division for the USS division in the for the full year. But we 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 gone through the numbers. We think our our forecasts are still in line, uh, still on track. Uh, we. Going forward, um, we uh, management concede uh, uh, also agree that the heightened geopolitical tensions is which is actually try driving more bigger decisions on on spending and whether and, and also decisions on spot stockpiling of defense and cybersecurity products and services which will uh, uh, benefit them from twenty uh, uh, further down the road. So we're keeping our target price at 450 uh, in a buy call. Thank you. Can we move to the next, please? Please, uh, the next stop. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, this is uh, Sam Court Industries. Sam Court Industries had the investor day, held an investor day. Uh, more, more like uh, a, a chance for them to dispel some of the some of the concerns in the market. Uh, they they uh, announced that they plan to spend fourteen billion in cap capital expenditure from twenty four to twenty eight, of which uh, the 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 renewable energy will account for seventy five percent of this. You can tell from the pie chart on the left. The in uh yeah. The data will bring their renewable energy the capacity, install capacity from 8.7 gigawatts currently to about 25 gigawatts. This will the uh, this 14 billion will be funded mainly by operating cash flow. Uh, about half of that will be from operating cash flow and uh 30% from project debt. And they will also be raising third party money uh to to do to be involved to engage in this uh, uh building up of the renewable. Or portfolio, they they uh, confirm that there's no debt, no equity fundraising at Samcorp industry, and they don't need to do that. Okay. The EMA uh, Energy Market Authorities uh, recently announced uh, a, a proposal to centralize the gas procurement for the country. Uh, Samcorp confirmed that there will be minimal impact for them at least until twenty twenty eight, because the, the, this this uh, centralized uh, procurement program will not have any impact on those contracts that have been sealed and signed. Uh, and they will grandfather all those that has been uh that that has been entered into. So therefore, uh Semcorp's uh, earnings will from this con uh conventional energy business will be more or less um uh, uh predictable. They they earn a fixed dollar margin above their their procurement cost and all the carbon additional carbon taxes are passed on to the customer, so so that that this part of the earnings is uh very very uh certain. Okay. We we're going by the uh, discussion with the management. We estimate that they their projections in the projections they think that 
uh, out uh, the in the FY twenty eight about fifty per fifty percent of the net profit will be generated from renewable energy. Uh, and these are mainly onshore wind, uh, solar and uh, energy storage. Uh, no offshore wind uh, for them. Uh, offshore wind is the is the sector that has been gathering a lot of attention lately, a negative press because uh, some of the players have declared that without government funding, especially in the US, they're, they're, this this business cannot offshore wind business cannot be profitable for them anymore with the rising inflation and the and the higher uh, material costs. But renewable energy uh, still generate a lower ROE of about 10% compared to 50% uh, for conventional energy. Still, this this because this is renewable energy is likely going to command a premium uh, valuation multiples. Therefore, we think our target price of $6 is intact. Uh, the, the, the one negative we uh, took away from the briefing was the uh, the very weak uh, property market in Vietnam that has impacted the ability to sell more units at the at their integrated urban solutions division. Okay. So we are maintain our we maintain our earnings forecast for 23 and 24 for Sengkok Industries. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, please move on to the next slide. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, this is my last one. Singapore Airlines, uh, first half. Uh, 24 results. Uh, yeah, the numbers uh, uh, beat our forecast uh, mainly because they, they surprisingly they managed to lower the fuel cost uh, despite adding 29% uh, more capacity into the system year on year. Uh, and they also booked a hedging gain of 244 million uh, during this uh, first half, even though jet fuel prices were on the way up from, from July to September. So it was quite quite uh, amazing and also puzzling. The in terms of use, uh, when we look at passive passenger revenue per available kilometer, it fell only two percent, mainly because of the very high load factors. But if we just look individually at passive passenger revenue per occupied seats, that has fallen by eight per eight point five percent. So so uh, it confirms our conclusion that. Use are on the way down. Why? Why are use down? Uh, to for one, for bit, uh, two, two, many two reasons. One is uh, the ticket prices are, are cheaper now, uh, for some for on some lines where comp competition has gone up has come up. The second one is there's a very, uh, the additional capacity for them and the additional loads for them. So many coming from Scoot, uh, Scoot had like uh, almost uh uh. uh 70% increase in, in, in revenue contribution uh, and very, very high load factors. But uh, budget carriers, uh, they, they tend to have a lower lower yield. Okay. So, and the other thing that, the other, uh, the, the other item that boosts the profit numbers is the very high net interest income due to that, um, higher rates. And also they had, a, at the end of last year, they had, 5.2 billion in net cash. But that is no more. That that has uh has fallen to about uh one point net debt of 1.2 billion in this quarter. It is it, uh, the end of September. So the gearing is now 6.6 percent, and that will be even the uh, debt level will go up further because well, after they announced the 50 percent redemption of 50 percent of the remaining MCBs, that will cost them 1.7 billion and uh, higher capex to be spent in the second half, which they did uh, barely, uh, they barely spent any in the in this first half. Okay. The, so the cargo remains weak. The yield for cargo has fallen by 46% to 41 cents per load ton kilometer. But this is still higher than pre-COVID of 31 cents. So we think there's still more room for cargo to fall. And also for passenger yield, we think it will also come back down to the uh, pre-COVID uh, average about Seven cents per, uh, uh, available kilometers. So so it's from nine point six currently. So we think use have peaked because of the fading off of leisure, travel demand, and you uh increase capacity from, especially from those uh, North Asian carriers are very aggressive in terms of pricing, and in terms of uh adding on capacity. Um, we we uh maintain a reduced call, 
but uh, because it has gone this meeting Singapore Airlines from here will be in an X growth environment. So the target price should be just at one times the price to book of FY24. So the, the book at, at the end of March 24, we estimate is about $5.45. Okay, that's all for me for today. I'll pass on to Zin. Thank Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I'll move on to the technicals. Okay, so for the S&P 500, um, look at the chart, we broke out of this downtrend channel um, last week. And currently, we are quite near the retest of, of a highs in September at the start of September, which was close to 4,450 area. So for this, we are likely to see some uh, some form of consolidation. Yeah, so for the current resistance, it's likely to be at 4,510 to about 4,550 area, or the support could be at 4,385 to 4,440 area. Uh, as for individual counters, uh, we have a technical buy on Capital Investment Limited, uh, with an entry price of $3.14, uh, take profit level at Three dollars and forty-five cents. Stop loss at two ninety-seven, as and the stock last closed at three o nine on Friday. So for CLI, there was a breakout of this downtrend, downtrend channel. Uh, following a higher low, uh, formation. This was after this took place after the stock did a double bottom at the two ninety level. Uh, in no uh in November. So with that, with the increasing momentum, both MACD as well as RSI. Uh, the stock could potentially uh, test the uh, 345 resistance level again. Uh, should we continue its bullish uh, momentum? So the trade is currently in progress, but it's uh, down about uh, close to 1.6% currently. Yeah, so I think uh, that's all for me now. Uh, I'll pass on the time to Paul to talk about Comfort Delgro Group uh, third quarter update. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dean. Uh, so, so as the title suggests, I think for us, the, the outlook for for Comfort Del Grow will be on uh, higher prices and supporting the, the growth on, for the upcoming uh, next couple of quarters. Next slide. Okay, I'm not sure why my med video can't be seen, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, the results was uh, within our expectations. Uh, so as you can see from the, the table on the left, the earnings jumped up, uh, excluding disposal gains, about 48% year on year. So what is driving Comfort Delgo's uh, strong performance is actually, if you look at the under the positive, is actually the UK operations turnaround. So just to take a step back, uh, last year was a very challenging year for the UK bus operations because there was a shortage of bus drivers, there were strikes. So they had to, to pay the bus drivers much higher than before, otherwise you're going to get a big shortage. Uh, as a result of that, it obviously hurt their margins. Uh, they went into a net loss. Uh, but what happened is that then they, they under the, the contracts for buses, you get a repricing every year. So every year anniversary, you will reprice outwards according to the inflation rate. So as a result of this, uh, almost 70% of their contracts have been already repriced up to third quarter. That's why they sunk from an operating loss of 2 million to a profit of 6 million. Uh, there's also another part to this benefit is that because of the intense competition and some exited the industry, so uh, they also renewals. So all these bus contracts were also renewed every five years. So they're also renewing higher and the margins could come up to even you know, uh, mid-teens. So it's a big big turnaround from you no know, losses to mid-teens. Uh, the negative, uh, slightly to my surprise too, was the real profit. So the real profitability here I'm referring to is basically the the real in, in uh, or MRT lines here in Singapore. So although the volumes are up, uh, but and the in the the fares are higher, as we all know, the government also paying higher. But because electricity spiked this year, uh, you will only get the the benefit by end of December where the fares will go up one more time. Then only next year they will bend the, they will get the offset from the higher electricity this year. So there's always a lag from the profitability because the the higher prices will only be enjoyed the following year. So in terms of outlook, we 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 lower our revenue slightly, but our profit is up. So in terms of the outlook for the company, uh, the, we think the earnings momentum can sustain. Uh, first is, of course, higher bus service fees in the UK, which, which I think I just mentioned. Uh, taxi platform fees in Singapore. So they introduced the 17. So if you, if you order a Grab, uh, sorry, if you order a Zig now, uh, uh, you will notice there's a 70 cents for every ride. So they actually included that. So that's new, only implemented in July. So you have at least four quarters of that. And of course, you get a lag pricing of real services. Uh, they did mention that taxi is getting more competition now uh, from the other ride operators uh, like 
I guess Gojek and Grab. So next slide. So uh, in terms of uh, Singtel uh, aggressively re restructuring to reality. So for us, the highlight of the results is not so much the results, but uh, they are doing a lot of restructuring of the whole business. Uh, next slide. So it, the revenue and all, um, EBITDA was generally in line with, with expectations. Uh, the the one positive is you look at the bottom of the chart on the left, you see the interim dividends actually grew quite strong, uh, strongly, about 13%. Uh, what, the other benefit was that the NCS business, which is IT services, started to, to enjoy margin expansion, although revenue up 8.8, .8, but you can see the margin jump up. Why margin is important is, as you know, NCS was newly set up maybe two years ago, and they had to, uh, and they bought into Australia, then they bought into... Uh, and they expanded operations to try and lower their headcount costs in Vietnam and India. So all this restructuring take time, but it's uh, encouraging that they are improving the margins. The negative continues to be Optus. I probably see this for I don't know how many quarters. Really, but anyway, uh, there's still stubborn cost structure. So if you look at the table on the left again, so Optus, you can see the EBITDA is down 11%. And the underlying profit is actually down 70%. So they make only 13 million, considering the balance sheet is a 10 billion balance sheet, but they make only 13 million. So uh, the, the the ROI is or ROIC, whatever measure you want, ROE, whatever measure you want, is, is quite pathetic. So so that's why uh, they're actually undergoing a major restructuring, uh, I'll elaborate, but we maintain our buy with an unchanged target price. Our forecast slightly changed, anything less than 1%, I think is virtually unchanged. So, uh, But the key message for us, at least for for... Singtel is that they are still undergoing a major restructuring. So firstly, there's another 4 billion of assets to be monetized. Uh, another word for saying they're going to sell 4 billion of assets. So they did done some, they sold part of their digital, uh, the data center business. Uh, the other thing is that they sold uh, TrustWave here that you notice. So, and the other restructuring that they've been doing, at least is historical, uh, is that the, they are deploying out more resources into the growth sectors, uh, like we mentioned, data centers and IT services. They dispose TrustWave and another two more other businesses that save almost 200 million in operating costs. But this is operating losses which has been done over the last two, three years. Uh, what is new is that they announced another 600 million cost up program. So that means they're going to take out another 200 million of costs. A lot of it is going to come out from Optus. Uh, so that's why, uh, uh, of course, there was some news on the CEO today. I'm not sure that's part of it, but anyway, it's anything that can cost out because the profitability in, in Optus is just too low. Uh, next slide. Okay, so for Valuetronics, the results, they are starting to return to growth after five years and they are trading, the share price trading around 90% of, the, of their net cash. Next slide. So the results, uh, rev the revenue was slightly below, I explained later, but the earnings was above our experiments. So there's a recovery in margins. You notice the revenue was down 15, but the gross profit was up. So one of the reasons why the revenue is down, if you go under negative, is, is because of the components. So uh, a year ago, uh, so Valuetronics, uh, sorry, is a contract manufacturer, something similar to uh, Venture. Uh, but what happened for them is the last year of the component shortage, there was a lot of semiconductors because uh, you're short, shortage, right? So you can't find, so you have to go to the spot market. Uh, probably the distributors are hoarding about that, but they probably had to buy at the spot price, which is very expensive, and the customers had to pay. So that's one of the reasons why the revenue came down so sharply. Uh, the other positive is they announced a four cent special dividend. If you look at the last row here, four cents. This is the first time they announced a special dividend during an interim. Because normally, if they want to do it, they will do it in the final results. Uh, so the outlook, uh, we raised the, our forecast. If you look at on the on the left again, uh, so of course, gross profit up, OPEX is so down, so operating profit improved. But the one that has also helped them a lot was the interest income because they have like 1 billion Hong Kong dollar of net cash. So in terms of our view is that uh, we raised our target price that uh, firstly, around 90% of the market cash in, in cash. So about they have about 200 million of cash. Uh, and right now, what is different is after five years, there's visibility of earnings growth because uh, they announced four new customers. Uh, we should contribute more in the second half and also uh, next year. Uh, and of, of course, they're trading a 6% dividend yield. And the other benefit that pro can protect the share price is that they have another committed like 182 million Hong Kong dollars of shares to buy. Uh, if you take current price, it's about 50, 60 million worth of shares. So you will notice the last one, two days, uh, they've been buying back shares. 
next slide. Uh, okay, Starhub, uh, next one. Uh, so nothing exciting uh, about the, the 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 earnings. I mean, if you look at the table on the left, EBITDA is up 4%. Or so it's not like we're going to like, pop champagne and celebrate here. But uh, the positive is that the rev the cybersecurity continues to do well. So the revenue jump about 45 But again, this can be quite volatile. Uh, the negative is that what we do see is that there continues to be intense uh, pricing pressure in Singapore. The ARPU means selling price for mobile and also broadband. Uh, the broadband, what's happening is that uh, TPG, uh, which is co now called Simba, is uh, uh, coming into broadband. So there's a lot of preemptive price action. I think something similar, as you all know, last time, uh, as you as you know, before TPG entered as the fourth mobile operator, all the competition start to cut price before they come. So I, I think it's, that's the same thing that's happening in the broadband segment. Uh, we maintain our forecast. Uh, the one positive is that FY24 would will look much better because this will be the tail end of their Dare Plus investments. So in the last one, two years, you notice me keep on talking about this Dare Plus. So this is their initiative to spend almost about 300 million to upgrade their back-end system so that they can got more revenue opportunities. Also to buy EPL content. So uh, because that one's a bit more, more neutral on that. Uh, but, uh, so all this is ending and then they should give the uplift to earnings in FY24. Uh, one in other interesting thing is that they have a cyber sec security arm and sign that actually does cyber security work for a lot of government agencies here. Uh, they continue to build up the franchise, uh, but it's just very hard to price because the earnings is small. So for us, we just price them like any like a telco, which obviously isn't the right thing. But uh, until it becomes a much more stronger franchise, or if they have plans to monetize it, then it could actually help the the share price if we do some some of the parts valuations. Uh, next slide. Okay, so for for VTech, so uh, okay, did, so just to give you a bit of background, it's not that we we like this company and we decided to go and write about it, but what has happened is that uh, MES and CS has worked together to um, I wouldn't say work together, but MES instructed CS to appoint a few research houses to write about this uh, D spec. Uh, so that's why you notice in bold here that we receive uh, monetary compensation, but it, it uh, doesn't Im impact us. We still have a negative view. But uh, so there's a few houses I think, uh, including CIMB, us, and uh, and another company. Uh, uh, so uh, move on to the next slide to write about this D spec. Yeah. So, so just to give a background, so this is a spec, a special purpose acquisition vehicle that that raise uh, uh that raise probably about two hundred million plus at $5 per share at IPO and and the money is being used to for acquisition. It's called blind. So you just give money to this to the to Vertex and then they didn't tell you what they're going to buy until now. So so surprised. So uh, 2nd October they announced they're going to acquire this company called 17 Life. So 17 Life is a pure play live streaming platform as, uh, with their main market markets in Japan and Taiwan. So obviously nobody understand what I just said, but live streaming means it's something like what you're looking. So uh, you can't see my face now, but thankfully, but uh, it's like a live streaming. So people will be will be like either singing. You can go to the website and see. So people will be singing live, chit chatting with their audience. Then what what happens is that if you go under the business model, uh, most of it comes from uh, they call it live. So it'll be I can be singing. So what happens is how they generate revenue is that. Uh, so let's say I'm an attendee now. Let's say you're an attendee watching. You can't see me, but you're watching us speaking. Then you buy tokens. Or you you pay actual cash. You buy virtual gift. Uh, then once you give me something, let's say you give me one dollar of tokens or whatever, as as because uh you like the way I sing. Uh, obviously nobody does, but uh then you then that will be considered as money. The one dollar. Uh, when the attendee buy the coins, it's not considered as revenue. But once you you give it to me, then it's considered a revenue. Uh, then 17 Live, the platform will share it with me as a streamer. That's why you say the revenue only recognized when the streamer receive. Uh, so just to go just to go back again, so they are acquiring this live streaming company called 17 Live uh, for 800 million of shares. So there's no cash. They're just going to issue 160 million shares. Uh, okay, so this is the important part. That's why we put in, in red. Uh, that I, oh, if, you have a, if you have a client or if you yourself own the spec, uh, do 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 look out to to vote in favor for this. So this is very important, uh, because if you don't vote in favor, even if you want to redeem, uh, you cannot because 
then you have to wait until it's liquidated. So my our recommendation is to vote in favor and to fully redeem uh your your spec at the price of either five dollars or five oh two per share. Uh the redemption date is submit by 28 November. So just to recap again, if you do not vote in favor, that means if this spec then this thing can go into self-liquidation mode. So then you cannot even get your redemption money, then it will this company will have to go to liquidation. Uh they can extend it from another one year after. So this spec is life is two years. So it's the like end of 2020, it's 20 January 24. Because it listed right 20 Gen 22, then they can extend for one year, but you take the risk that they have to liquidate, then you'll take a long time you know, to go and get your money back. Uh for us, why we uh, advise investors to to liquidate, I mean to redeem the five dollars or five oh two, is because we once we did our valuations, uh, there's a report out that you can read it. Uh, uh the valuations we think is five oh eight before redemption. Then obviously you say why not just keep it, but there's this thing called earn out shares. So to buy 17 life is not just this 800 million. So if they actually uh if they actually meet certain financial targets, which are, in our own opinion isn't a very very stretch, we'll show you later, but they will issue another 20, I think 20 million or 21 million of new shares for free because you meet some certain targets, which you're gonna meet anyway. So uh, so this is not the in a way you could say this is not the real acquisition price. You've got to add another hundred million to it, which will be given. Uh, another reason not in this chart here is that we think, uh, this is our own view, I mean, because it's not disclosed in the circular. We think those people who receive these 160 million shares, their cost could be, I don't know, $1, 150. Uh, this is our own estimate because the one thing about the circular, they don't tell you what's the cost. So although there's a moratorium of six months, so you'll be going to be very disadvantaged because you're holding $5, everybody, everybody holding... Uh, one dollar to one fifty, or at most maybe two dollars. So good luck to whoever still holding it, holding it. Uh, next slide. So, uh, so to give you one quick, uh, so if you go to seventeen life, you see, uh, like all these are some of the videos. These are the people who are screening, uh, screening life. Uh, when I watch it, there are probably a lot more people. Of course, people who look attractive. So that's why I cannot do it. But uh, it will. We see people like like singing. Then you can contribute gifts, then can chit chat uh, virtually uh, with, with these people. Uh, the growth area for 17 Life is this thing here on the right here. It looks like cartoon, yeah, but it's actually a person speaking. So the when you look at the screen, you'll see this image here, uh, but it's actually a person speaking. So it's called you call it a virtual life. So this is supposed to be the new growth area. Uh next slide. So, so this is my last one for me. So I, I know it's a lot of numbers here, but why this is important is because uh if you if you look in in red here. Uh, so this is the existing number of shares. So right now, uh, Vertex has 41.61 million shares. But this thing is going to jump to almost 200 shares once uh, the, this deal is completed. So of course, you uh, the sellers of, 70, of uh, 17 Live will receive 160 million shares. So this one, we are a bit worried because we're not sure what's the cost here. Uh, we, our own guess could be, like I said, the 150 $2 at most. Uh, then they're going to get another 20, so not 21, sorry, 24 million shares. So at the end of it, uh, assuming no redemption, there's almost 240 million shares. And the original people are just going to own 40 million. So there's going to be a lot of shares out there. So uh, good luck. About, uh, so the, to get these 24 million shares, uh, they need to hit these targets. So in our own view, this isn't very stretched targets. I mean, they need to, the EBITDA is going to fall 14% in the second half, and then the revenue is going to grow 4%. So why this is important is that uh, they don't really have to do a lot to gain, I'm not saying they don't have to do a lot, but they don't have to really grow the company very aggressively to get this extra 24 million shares. Uh, of course, there's also the 2024 targets, but I didn't go to that, uh, where they get another much more shares. Uh, that one is a bit tougher, a bit the uh, financial targets, but uh, I didn't want to complicate things, but just to give you a flavor that, uh, just that there's a lot of shares. So if, if, most of the shareholders are in this bucket here. You see the 29.61 here. So most of us will be having, if you own this, you'll be having under this 29.61. And this will just jump almost 10 times to 240 million shares. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay, so uh, I know we have a bit too much stuff here today, but uh, let me just run through some of the data points, the macro, key macro for last week. 
So for some of the key macro, uh, ready mix demand actually picked up very strongly. Uh, it's up about 9%. So uh, the demand has really bounced back from second quarter. So demand for ready mix concrete, uh, uh, ready mix, uh, ready mix concrete is up nine percent. Uh, uh, this is this is basically wet cement, and the main ones are uh, up, up. Yeah. Uh, so so pen. Uh, so so these are the the next one is the SIA. Sorry. Uh, passengers carry also grew twenty seven percent, of twenty nine percent. Uh, in China, the retail sales seems to be picking up. It's the strongest in in uh, five months. Uh, the problem for China is the fixed assets is actually still weak, about 2.9. So as you take a step back, you know, China used to grow because there's a lot of investments. So the problem now is the private sector doesn't want to invest, but only the state-owned governments are investing. Uh, property continues to be weak. It's still down 21%. Uh, in the US, retail sales is also starting to slide back down. So we're hitting a soft patch here, uh, and inventories are starting to, to accelerate after four months. Uh, the CPI is slightly above. Okay, uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of our tactical views, uh, we're starting to see another soft patch of data coming up from the US. Uh, the market rally, just uh, because we, we think not very strong foundation, the market rally because 0.1% um, better than expected CPI. Uh, so just to, to explain, you know, recession always people ask us, so just to take a step back. So right now we don't uh, really see any signs yet. Uh, but just to remember that you no know, recession is not just the GDP uh, contracting. Uh, what we what you need to see is that there's a ne this negative spiral or this doom loop or, or vicious loop downwards of, of falling sales because sales down then uh, manufacturers cut output then because they cut output then they have to cut employment. So we haven't seen this negative spiral because the government spending has been very strong in in the US. So in our own view, uh, for a recession to happen in the US, we need an extended period of shrinking deficits. That means we need to see the government not supporting the economy. Then this could trigger the thing. But uh, we need seen it so far one month, the deficit is down. So I mean, this is just our own view of the macro in the US. Uh, for China, we think there's a trading opportunity because uh, the data should is turning a bit more favorable like retail sales. And uh, there's this base effect because last year, fourth quarter was the, probably the worst of the pandemic. And the government is also increasingly supporting the economy. Uh, you see one trillion recently of loans uh, to the local government for infrastructure. And there's also another plan, one billion for the property developers to help fund the property developers. Uh, Achilles here, because property I mentioned is still big. Uh, not many key events, but we have CSE this week uh, for those who are interested to attend. Uh, next slide. Uh, so you can see that the RMC demand of ready mix con concrete is starting to to rebound again to uh, uh, to actually new records or almost or probably exceeding the twenty nineteen levels. Uh, this on the right is just the S SIA passenger traffic for your reference. Uh, next slide. Uh, then you see here retail sales is starting it bounced uh, in the third quarter but starting to slide back down again for the US. Uh, compared to China, the retail sales is starting to accelerate. So there's a bit of divergence here where China looks a bit better, at least here. Uh, next slide. Uh, then the problem for China, uh, if you look at 2006, you know that the private sector was actually very positive on China. But then you now you can see here it's contracting very sharply. So uh, of course, there are all kinds of reasons, uh, including, of course, the crackdown of the internet companies. Uh, residential is the weak, weak, weak point for China continues to contract. Uh, the one in red is the number of units. So it's trending about 9 million and we think it can hit probably 7 million. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, of course, this is the CPI thing. that The one on the left is the CPI. Uh, you will notice the one that is the still the highest level is still the black line. So the black line is where it's still very stubborn. It's almost 6 to 7%, uh, which is shelter rental. So that, that is the thing that is still holding back the CPI. Uh, then the one that also starting to worry us is that inventories are starting to build back up. So the blue line is the inventory. So if if retail sales continue to be weak, then the, the inventory is just going to keep on piling up. And, and this won't be good for manufacturing sector and of course the whole economy. Next slide. Uh, okay, uh, this for AEM. Uh, just two, one, two more last slides for me. So, so AEM had a third quarter briefing. Uh, the, uh, the, the earnings, excluding the exceptions, was down about 50%. There was this exception item. They actually paid 20 million confidential arbit arbit arbitration because they paid to, uh, because uh, they think they paid to Advantas. 
the guidance and the one thing I guess if there's any positive that they didn't remove the guidance but it's also in the good news is that they didn't remove the revenue guidance if you look on the table on the on the left here the part here guidance so their guidance is the same as the second quarter uh, but the bad news is that you can expect fourth quarter to be down revenue 60 to 80 percent so fourth quarter is going to be worse than the than the third quarter on year on year because if you if you, you know you do the guidance basic maths so you you're looking at 73 to 103 million revenue uh, they, con they continue to be positive on the test 2.0 so uh, uh, so aem is a the manufacturer equipment test equipment for semiconductors especially for the very high end as the industry move from ate the old method to uh, slt uh, system level test uh, i know it confused everyone but uh, in terms of the outlook they say that the worst downturn in the past 20 years, obviously, you know, earnings down 50. But uh, the problem they see in the market right now is there's uh, underutilization of equipment. Uh, because last year, there was a huge uh, capex. So, of course, last year, they did very well. So, there's a lot of equipment already installed, but the utilization is very low. So, and and then there's also not only the utilization, though, there's also excess inventory. Uh, yeah. So, that they, they have, you, you, there's two challenges. So, even though utilization goes up, you still need to clear the inventory. So, uh, the key message they had here is that the uh, recovery they think is only second half of 24. Uh, uh, next slide. Okay, last time about UMS, so the earnings also declined about 45. I'm using PBT because uh, they had a one-off special tax. Uh, so that one will kind of uh, impact the thing. Uh, the one that's hurting them is not the front end, not the integrated systems, which they do for, I guess, uh, we believe is applied materials. Uh, let's move on to the fourth bullet point of inventory. So the thing that they highlighted was that uh, there's too much inventory in the system now. And to give you a sense, if you look at equipment guys like Lum Research, the inventory is almost tripled uh, from 1.5 to almost 5 billion. Then applied materials also you know, uh, up 50%. So they just think the, uh, the inventory is too much and then it takes time to digest. Uh, they still think the new, the new customer for their Batu Kawan Penang plant can still grow and they think Hopefully, it can hit their, their, their aim or hopeful, hopeful that it can hit maybe 300 million in revenues once it's running full. Uh, again, too much inventory and the one that's hurting is more the back-end equipment. So, they, there's two parts to the business which is they assemble the front-end equipment and then they do uh, parts for back-end equipment and that's the one that is the contracting more uh, if you look under the financials. Okay, I don't want to hold up too much time because uh, this one is a bit long for today. So, uh, let's move on to Q&A. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I'll take some of the questions first. Uh, okay. Um, hold on. Uh, let me just double check. Okay. Uh, yeah. One on the DBS. How? What does the six months restriction on new business venture mean exactly? And what is the impact on the bank other than increases in compliance and IT costs? So for the six months restriction on new business venture, it just means that they. They cannot do any acquisitions and I think they cannot even those small acquisitions also they can't they can't do it. So this means that I think it, it also means for their overseas uh, ventures as well. So I think the most recent one would be their Citibank Taiwan acquisition. They they can't acquire more, they can't expand more, but it's only for a short six months. So this is just to sort of you know MES telling them that hey, you better concentrate on what you have now and to ensure that it is working well instead of just trying to expand as fast as possible, you know, instead of just looking at whatever you have now and ensuring that the customers are satisfied. So I think some, some back, uh, what, what happened previously was that, uh, for those who don't know, is that the, the DBS had suffered this multiple outages. And I think the most recent one was quite quite bad the whole day. You know, you couldn't use any of their services, including their pay, la, uh, pay now function, which is, not only affecting the consumers, it also in fact affects the business owners. So business owners couldn't accept payment apart from maybe cash or if you use OCBC or UOB. But if majority of Singaporeans, you know, using DBS as their main bank account, this really affected their, their businesses, you know, where they couldn't accept cash, consumers also couldn't couldn't pay apart, but couldn't accept sorry, the payment by a QR code or whatever. And consumers also couldn't pay. So so I guess this MES just telling DBS to you know you to, to concentrate on what they have currently to ensure that it's working well. And what is the impact on the bank other than increases in compliance and IT costs? Yeah, so the, 
uh, Piyush Gupta, the DBS CEO, did say that they're going to come up with, I think, 80 or 90 million Sing dollars worth of, they, they sort of, uh, they find themselves. Uh, you know? So MES didn't find them, but they did say that they're going to set aside this money to grow, to um, sort of boost their, their IT um, sort of uh, infrastructure, right? And what is the bad, other impact? I guess the other big impact would be the reputation. So DBS has been hit by this a couple of times now. Maybe the first two times people are saying, yeah, you know, it's just an accident, one-off. But now when it happens like four or five times, people are wondering, you know, why why is there some some problem with DBS? And, you know, maybe for those people who are, who are looking to, to open a new bank account, like those entering the workforce or uh, companies who are starting up, this might affect them because they now now is a consideration in their mind whether they should open it this bank account with DBS or they should go to their competitors like UOB and OCBC. So 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 apart from compliance and IT costs, they also need to spend more on their marketing as well as you know maybe spend more on the salary of uh, sort of like the staff costs where they they have to you know uh, try to. To attract more customers or maybe even retain the, the existing customers so they definitely have to work more on that as well yeah uh what okay second question what bank what's bank what okay, okay i guess the question is what is the bank net interest income outlook and how does the outlook affect dbs ocbc and UOB? so basically the three banks okay so the interest net interest income outlook for the banks as well as the net interest margins outlook is that it will be for 2024 is that it will be quite flat you know we will see net interest margins starting to stabilize at the current level so they did say that the net interest margins will remain stable and that might not you know you might might seem that it might not be a good thing because it's not increasing right but because net interest margins are very high currently and they reach like record levels so the current high levels that they can if they can maintain it will be very good for the banks means that they are still earning good net interest income. And I guess one of the things that will sort of uh, increase their net interest income further would be the loans growth. So loans growth has been a continued decline for the banks for the last couple of quarters already. This was mainly due to the high interest rates, you know, and people are more hesitant on taking out loans and companies as well. So this, when, you know, the rates are sort of, you know, the, the consumers start to feel that, okay, the rates are already reached the peak. Right, they cannot go any higher or they have no other choice. Then you know we'll see this pickup in loans growth. So they are also expecting a pickup in the loans growth going to FI24, where they will be looking at maybe low to mid single digit. And this will also further boost their net interest income. So I think that I hope that answers your question where you where we'll see a possible uptick in net interest income going into FI24. Let me see, I think I have one more, one, one or two more questions. Uh, oh, maybe not. Um, okay, wait, this thing, I think I saw one more. Okay, I think one about asking how they performed during the last recession. Uh, I guess, you know, if you look, uh, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on this, but if you look at the most recent one, it will be during COVID. So the banks obviously were, were hit quite hard by COVID. You know? I think the majority of what happened during that period was that they had to provision a lot, right? So they had to take on a lot of provisions. You know, their allowances were extremely high, uh, both the GP and the SP. And I think you look at the, what is currently happening, especially in this quarter, you can see that they have sort of uh, preemptively or prudently increased their allowances first. So all three banks, you know, they have given different reasons why they have increased their allowances. But, you know, if you look at it, they, they, they're doing it uh, on a very quite prudent basis where they are doing it before... Uh, uh, sort of a scenario, uh, sort of a, like a worst case scenario can happen. I think UOB is the one that has openly said that they have increased their specific allowance on you know, solely because they are rebalanced, prudent, preemptively rebalanced their collateral value in US and Hong Kong and China. And they have also said that these accounts are not distressed or non-performing. So they are actually paying their interest on time and they are not showing any weakness. But this was more of a preemptive move so that you know when when if anything happens, if anything happens, they are prepared for the worst case scenario. Yeah. Um 
I think there's one more about DBS. DBS price over book value is 1.4x, relatively high. What's your recommendation for a buy call in relation to the other banks? So yeah, we do have a buy call. Um, I think all three banks, we do have a, a, a similar call, a buy call. I think for DBS, it's the uh, continued name growth from the higher for longer interest rates. And you know they have also mentioned multiple times the, of the recovery in their fee income, which will sort of sustain their earnings momentum. And they do they, they also have this Citibank acquisition in Taiwan where where they are uh, I mean they have also they, they said that there's a 10 billion uh, addition to their loan book. So we can see that the Citibank will probably grow their both their fee income and their loan book uh, significantly going into the future. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think there's one in the chat. Let me see. Um, I think someone said system integration problems with the new bank acquired. I think this is referring to DBS. I'm not sure, but I don't. I don't think so. I don't think this is a system integration problems. A problem with the new bank acquired. They didn't really say, but I think one of them was you know where they had an external vendor and the and the and the server sort of like uh uh like you know couldn't work or something. So. That, that was a problem that was out of their control, right? Where they said it was really, really couldn't, they couldn't control that problem because I think one of the other things where they said that why, why don't they bring everything in-house, right? They asked uh, DBS, why don't they bring everything in-house where they can control it? But it's, they also say it's very hard to bring everything in-house. And even, you know, you look at UOB and OCBC, they also don't do everything in-house. They do have to, they do have to outsource it to external vendors because these vendors are sort of experts in, in the field where they, I think it was, uh, I can't remember what it was exactly, but they are experts in their field, which they do. So if DBS were to bring it in-house, they can't control it as well as the external vendors would do. So I think this external vendor thing might have been a, really a one-off, but the other issues were probably not a one-off and I think they are, they have to try, to, act, try to, to fix that problem so that it doesn't happen going into the future. Yeah, so that's all I have for my questions. I'll hand it over to the rest. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I'll take this question on Disney. Uh, there's just a question. Please comment on Disney. Uh, yeah, so in general, uh, I guess they, Disney announced their earnings earlier this month, I think on the 8th of November. And uh, the main, the key highlights for them was, um, obviously, you know, they were cutting a lot of costs over the last two quarters. Um, and now they're starting to focus a little bit more on uh, their streaming business, their ESPN business. Um, because the, the other side on the other side of the business, their yeah, theme parks is doing quite well. It's just that um for the longest time their streaming and entertainment business uh has really been dragging them down. Um so you know with the new CEO or the new old CEO, Bob Iger, uh he's he's kind of already set the direction on how they want to be moving, uh, how they want to be improving um um their streaming division as well as, as um building ESPN back to, to you know to where it was previously uh, but one thing for, for Disney that that um, we're a bit concerned about is when you compare just their streaming business to Netflix uh, in some aspects, uh, aspects they are a little bit inferior um, they don't monetize as well uh, and, and I guess just content wise is, is not as, as great as, as Netflix so uh, we do think that that uh, they, they even mentioned that, that Profitability for for streaming, you know, will come probably only in the fourth quarter of next year. So it's still quite a long ways away. Um, yeah, but but you know, when you look at the stock price, obviously a lot of people are very optimistic about Disney. Um, it, it's come down way off its highs. Um, and has seen you know well, like roughly twenty percent rally over the last month or so. I think a lot of it has to do with with uh just them leading out their the company. Uh, similar to what a lot of the other big tech companies were doing last year, they were just a little bit late to the game, and so, uh, we you know something we're we're looking at is is we're seeing how they're able to to I guess generate more operating leverage from them, the businesses, uh, as they are a little bit more leader and more efficient. Yeah, the 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 the, the big knock on Disney is that their main competition you know is, is number one is Netflix, number two is is when you talk about ESPN and all that, right now it's all it's mainly a broadcast and uh cable TV, which essentially is like a dying uh industry, you know, is being cannibalized quite a bit by by streaming. 
so uh, so unless they they there's a way for them to kind of uh it integrate lot most of their their other channels and broadcast channels onto you know maybe streaming platforms um but it'll still be a struggle for them but uh, uh, in my view uh, yeah Hopefully that that helps. Uh, just give it a bit more color. Thank you. Uh, I'll hand it back to the rest of my colleagues. I'll, I'll take over from here. Thanks, John. Okay. Um. Yeah. I'll, I will read out the question first. Um, um. Morning, Peggy. Can you provide some outlook on capital infra trust earnings potential? Just wanted to see your latest opinion. Um. The the. The capital KIT's uh, net net debt at the end of um September was two point three billion. Okay, this uh my, my calculation of the net debt because they they exclude many things like notes payable. They don't say that is uh that is something that they owe other people, so they didn't count that in. But I I will take those in. So it's two point three billion. Then that does not even take into account the six hundred million of uh, perpetual securities. So after this, they they continue to they upsize, they announce a special uh, dividend in third quarter, and mainly because they upsize uh, at some of the debt. So so going for uh, by the end of this year, I, I think net debt might be more like 2.5 billion. So your gear net gear is about one point nearly 1.2 times. Okay. The uh why the emphasis on net debt is because uh, uh interest expense becomes very important uh and in the calculation of disputable income for for KIT and if uh and if they raise debt at this at this point the we think the interest expense is not going to be cheap and therefore uh distribution uh going forward will be affected right um so so it's not um so uh. Yeah, I, I, I really I really I tried very hard to think positively about KIT. But still this this thing is uh, is a nagging concern. Uh especially if you raise that in the in a rising interest rate env uh, uh, environment. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure if I answer your question. If if not, please please just send me a follow-up uh, note. I think there's another note, a similar note on KIT that uh since the renewable energy segment is so encouraging at SCI, KIT would do well too with their recent entry into this space, right? Okay, we I think renewable energy uh, uh, at KIT, there are two, two types. Uh, they, they have investments in two uh, renewable. One is, uh, uh, both are in Europe. One is uh, onshore wind and one is uh, an offshore wind. Okay, the, the, the current... Uh, the current issues surrounding the this industry is on the offshore wind sector, especially as the Ofsted, a uh, very big uh, renewable energy player, has uh, announced that they pull out from the participation in the Norway, um, Norway offshore wind development, and they also before this has really scrapped through two U.S. offshore wind projects. They cited um the. They, they even uh, said that they might incur 5.6 billion right, sorry, uh, in, in related uh, impairments because the cost has ballooned due to the rising interest rates and also the uh, cost of supplies, uh, the, the supply bottlenecks. So, so uh, Hostel is a leading player in this sector. So they, what they say is really uh, have to impact, will impact this sector. And KIT's... Um, uh, renew offshore renewable energy uh, 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 company under BKR BKR two is has a long term contract. Uh, Austed has signed a long term contract to buy the wind, to buy the energy from out of from KIT's investments. Although the uh, yeah and and all the prices has also been been fixed. Uh, the and then in Germany itself another issue is that the German government has been. Because due to pressure on inflation on the in the country, they had actually lower the the stipulated uh price that these renewable energy players can charge the grid for their energy. Although this price, this lowered price is still higher than KIT's uh setting price. Uh, still this this actually point to us that the this this sector is really 
very much controlled, uh, centrally controlled, and, and it's really dependent on the on the country's policy here. So so uh, for, uh compar comparatively, SCI's uh, uh, renewable energy are all in on the uh, if they are sixty two percent are are uh, is wind, and all these wind are onshore. Okay. Uh, okay. SCI uh, valuation for renewable energy sector has not been really uh, uh, recognized by the market, mainly because their, their projects are in China, 62% in China, India, Southeast Asia, UK and Middle East only 1% of total in renewable energy portfolio. So, so you know, and China, India, all this, the, presumably the, the price you can sell to a grid will be lower. Right, uh, and and not not as attractive as the uh, developed countries like Europe, Europe or North America, but the but we this these countries uh have put in has uh, they are, have uh the, the countries that the government has dedicated uh a, 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 a dedicated and committed to to build up this uh this uh, renewable energy to to offset the 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 carbon footprints. So so the the, we, we, we feel that the for these developing countries the the projects are probably more secure and more more uh, certain compared to the the developed countries uh, in US and, and Europe. So so I uh that that's the key differential between SCI and KNT in, in this context. So KIT's price has also been pressured because of the, the contract with Austed, which has uh, come up with this profit warning. And they also have some onshore uh, wind portfolio in also in Europe where which is uh, facing a lot of negative press. Yeah. So so that, that's the difference between the two. Thanks. Um so let me move on. Um uh, Peggy, your SIA target price of 545 factor in the redemption of 50% redeemable remaining MCB. Uh the they now they they say they know redeem fifty percent of the remaining MCB for one point seven billion. After this, they still have a one point five billion worth of MCB. That that one I have not factored in. So if if that were to that could be redeemed before the close of the FY twenty four, which is March. If that will, will come in the, the the target price, that the book value will be even will be will dip slightly to nearer to five dollars. Thank you. Um, I think there's one more for me. Let me let me look for it. Um, okay, in your briefing with ST Engineering, was there any mention or at least hints of dividend increase in second in 2024? We we asked them about this. Uh, uh, uh they said that uh, this year 2023 the focus is to reduce the debt. So if they are able to reduce their debt and and still achieve uh, an ROE of of uh, a reasonable ROE, they, they didn't say how much is it. They they would be uh, inclined to raise their their dividend payout for twenty twenty four. Currently, they're committed to sixteen cents per per year or four cents per quarter. Thank okay. you. That's, that's all for me. I, I pass on to the rest first. Thank you. Okay, uh, so you can see my face, but then maybe it's for the better. Uh, okay, um, let, let me just try to answer some questions. So I'm not sure why my video can't. Uh, can you touch on the capital expenditure affecting getting Singapore share price? Uh, I'm not sure which cap um because whatever expansion they wanted to do the RWS 2.0 is already been announced. So uh, I'm not sure how it can affect it. But uh, again, I uh, I'm not too too clear because uh Genting don't invite analysts that do not cover them. So, but if you don't get invited, how are you going to cover them? So I'm not sure how, how they're going to solve that. So I guess we're never going to get invited. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, can you share your views on all tech? Can you invite them to do presentation? Yeah, I think they've all tech. Uh, Paul, can you, your views on all tech? So all tech is a, they, they provide capital 
uh, they provide plant and machinery for the uh, the plantation industry, palm oil industry. Uh, I think they've done one before uh, with, with us. So I will try to get them in. I, I don't have any strong particular view. I guess uh, like any company that benefit from selling equipment or capital expenditure, I don't know, don't see any major capex cycle by all the palm oil companies. So unless there's some major capex cycle, then this will benefit them because you know you're selling machine. So I, I don't really have a very strong view on it. Yeah. Until they can maybe show that the next two to three years there's this this big change and all the refineries and plant in the refining plantation companies need to upgrade. Uh Maple Tree Industrial Trust, any coverage on this counter? Yeah, sorry, we, we don't cover actually we don't really cover any maple tree companies. Yeah, they, they don't really get in touch with us anyway. So uh, 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 Singtel, uh, regarding the recent outage of Optus, do you expect any penalty from Australian government? How does Optus contribute to Singtel total profit? So, Optus contribute mainly at the EBITDA line. I, I think probably seven, uh, I don't know the exact number of uh, 60 70 percent of it comes from Optus. So, they are they are a major contributor at, uh, to, op, to Singtel because when we do valuation of Singtel. Uh, two thirds of it come from the associates, the party, the these are the ones that's growing the the Indonesian telco, the Indi India telco, the Thai telco, and so forth. Then one third the valuation comes from Optus and Singtel, and so forth. A penalty, uh, I think penalty is not not such a big issue. I think penalty, of course, it, it hurts. I mean, you, but you can pay. The bigger problem you worry is the impact on customers. The first time it happened, it didn't really uh affect their mobile numbers a, a lot. Maybe a little bit, uh. But but the, of course, this the repercussions for this one. We're not so sure. We need to see the results. Uh. But uh, my understanding. I mean, speaking to someone who who actually faced this was that the the problem was that I think you couldn't even do a uh, you couldn't even do a nine 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 call. That means you couldn't even call, do an emergency call. So that was the problem with this. This is not any simple outage. You, know, you cannot call. But if you can't do a nine 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 call, uh, if you can't do an emergency call, then that's the bigger problem. If you if you have a telco service and and people have emergencies and you can't call, then I'm not sure how you're gonna resolve that problem. Right? So so although they said the in financial impact, you know that one day might impact the revenue not that much, but there's other repercussions. So that one I'm not sure how they're gonna to resolve that. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi Paul. If you're holding the the VTEC warrants now, can we convert them to shares? Uh, you can convert, but I wouldn't advise you to convert. Uh, uh, because the conversion price is five dollars and seventy five cents. So we take share price now. I think it's like four ninety two. I, I didn't check today, but so. But the good thing is that you is better to just keep it as a warrant because these warrants can last can you no. Know, it's five years, so no point converting since they are so out of the money now. So it's better to just hold on to them. But again, those who applied for the VTEC IPO, these warrants are free. So. Uh, that's why we were advocating people to take up the IPO because you're gonna get free warrants and you can get back. It's like a, it's like a freebie, you know, because you can get back your money and then the, you get back your initial IPO. Uh, so we worry that a redemption can be quite high because a lot of people are just gonna do it because they have, they can have the free warrants, especially those who take the placement. So that's why our first report on spec was, a free lunch for the few because. Most of it, the these free warrants go to those people who did the first round of placements. So people, the public didn't get much of the placements. It's only to, I guess, select a few, inverted commas. They are the ones who will get the free warrants, not so much the public. Uh, what is the dividend yield of Singtel now with the increased dividend payout? Uh, the dividend yield for Singtel now is about 4, 4 point something percent. Is the dividend yield sustainable? They actually raised the, their payout ratio. I think from sixty to eighty to seventy to ninety, uh, I I think it's sustainable. Other you know, otherwise they don't gonna raise it, right? So, uh, the the dividend probably around maybe close to two billion, half of it comes from the associates and they generate a lot of free cash flow. So the the cash free cash flow a year is about two billion. That means excluding capex. So I think it's uh, sustainable, and the fact that they actually raised it, so I think uh their their payout ratio is also another sign that. They, they obviously have a better visibility than me that they think they can pay, they can maintain the dividends. So, so no, no issue on the dividends. Yeah. I mean, for me, like this. Uh, city development, fundamentally. Uh, city development, our analyst isn't here. Uh, both our REIT and property analysts are not here. But I think the whole cooling measure really hurt them. So the reasons why we, we 
he uh, promoted city development was because uh, they were they uh, before the recent cooling measures, they were the only few that had a lot of units for sale, so they didn't have to go into the market to bid for the high pricing. But the problem was they had one very big project, uh, uh, the redevelopment of the Fuji Xerox, which was unique because they didn't have to buy land, they just had to pay some uh, undisclosed amount, must be pretty low. And they and their uh, plot ratio increased. That means they could sell. It's almost like a uh, freebie in a way, excluding the development cost. But when the cooling measures was announced just a day or two before they launched, then that one really hurt them. Uh, so that was the main reason. Uh, that was the the re one of the reasons why. And they, they and there was going to be some restructuring with, with the REITs in the UK, and that didn't pan out well. So, uh, these are the things. Of funding, they are, they are still okay because they still have the hospitality, but it's not as good as we had initially expected. Uh, okay, let me answer one or two more. Uh, uh okay, so, sorry. Uh, the, uh, seems like, like the tech venture UMS AEM Nano still weak. recovery anytime soon. Yeah, okay. The in the end, if you want to buy these stocks, I think. Uh, this semiconductor is is almost like a macro view. Uh, you, because their customers is also the, relying on the macro to improve. Uh, and you know we are not very confident on the macro for the US, so we think any recovery is probably fourth quarter next year. Uh, that's our own view. Uh, and believe me, you're not disadvantaged uh, because their customers also not don't have much visibility. So your your information is as good as them. Uh, because they are all dependent on how the macro conditions uh, improve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Let me take on. Uh, how would Optus outage sink down the mid uh, mid term? I think mid to long term is is not a big issue. Uh, the 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 bigger problem for them in Singtel in Australia now is the uh, very intense competition. I I don't have the exact number, but I think there's like fifty NVNOs out there or more. Uh, and we are those that you know they they are, they don't own the network. Uh, but they like Circle Life here. But you can imagine like times fifty or something or those levels. So there's very intense competition in in Australia. So until that a bit, so that's going to be uh, very challenging for them. Uh, with the U.S. recession looming, what does it mean for Singapore and Singapore, uh, Singapore and uh, Singapore, uh, Singapore and Singapore stocks? Any recommendations on stocks against U.S. recession? Uh, the most obvious choice would be those. Uh, I mean, theoretically, those stocks that are not affected by any economic, less sensitive to an economic cycle. So for us, we think is you end up being the REITs uh, in a way because if there's a recession in the US, you, they're going to cut rates and the least sensitive will be the Singapore as Singapore REITs uh, because you no, know, they're just collecting rental, right? Unless the tenant default, uh, maybe your rent won't grow but at least the, your, uh, the tenant won't, won't uh, unless the tenant go bankrupt and close, uh, which, which we are likely at least most of the Singapore assets. Uh, so, for us, it's going to be the most obvious choice is going to be REITs. And, and maybe some of those unique business trusts, you know, uh, like Net, Netlink, Netlink NB, NBN, you know, those that, that, because of fiber, right? Yeah. I, I think I will hold it for now. We go to the TA once, then we'll come and get back. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's a bit long today. Yeah. Okay, hey, thanks for, uh, I'll move on to the TA. You know, first one will be IFAS. Okay, IFAS has continued uh, to trend upwards. Uh, currently, it's hit a bridge, another um, key level, which is around uh, 795. Yeah, so uh, it was this previous support level over here. Yeah, so for IFAS, I think, yeah, obviously the uptrend is still still very strong. Uh, could continue to trend higher. The next key level to watch out for will be around at around close to 8.30 over here, where there was a, a more stubborn resistance back then. Okay, then next up will be uh, DBS. Okay, DBS I think is currently uh, trading in this descending wedge over here, so there's still some weakness in terms of the price. Uh, I would, but I would expect some support closer to about $32 over here, where it meets the trendline support as well as the previous swing low back in August over here. Yeah, so for DBS, yeah, the share price movement looks uh continues to be still weak. 
um, but some support is quite is nearby. Okay, then next up will be China Aviation. Okay, so China Aviation, I think it's currently trending uh, in this uptrend channel for now. So with that, potentially price will still continue to see a little bit on upside towards the 89 cents level where it meets the channel resistance as well as a pre the previous uh, key support breakdown over here. And yeah. Okay, then next up will be Escort. Okay, Escort, I think is currently a uh, potential. Um, it looks like it potentially break, broke out of this uh, downtrend channel over here. Uh, there's still some resistance over, above the 94 cents level, but the positive is that higher lows have been formed uh, recently. So I think with that, the stock could potentially be just trading range bound for now. Uh, support, support is likely to be, I think, around at the 90 cent level. Yeah. As for CDL Hospitality Trust, I think it's um, tr potentially trying to break out this trend line resistance over here, as well as the 103 resistance level. A uh, good thing is that uh, the higher low has been formed and currently I think uh, needs some more momentum to try to break, break out this uh, 103 level. Yeah, so for now, it could be just uh, raging for a while, but I think there's some, it, there's a bullish bias or CDL Hospitality Trust. Okay, then for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, I think currently uh price is at some resistance at 160. So this was the this would be a retest of this um wedge broke uh breakdown that occurred in October. So currently we are doing some retest. Uh over here I expect some resistance to hold still. So for MLT, I think uh there could be some sideways consolidation first. Uh, but overall, the short term uptrend is still intact. Uh, as we've seen, higher highs and higher lows being formed still. Okay, the next up will be um on the STI. Okay, I think for STI, uh, we are currently trading in this blue color um, descending wedge pattern over here. So uh, we found resistance at three one seven zero upon the retest of this. Um, head and shoulders break down over here and currently still seeing some weakness for now. So yeah, for SDI, I think uh, there's still likely to be some form of weakness uh, in the near term since you are trading this uh, downwards trending uh, pattern over here. Yeah, then the near term support, the yeah, retest of the 3090 level again. Okay, then for Sencorp Industries, uh, there was a Break out of this uh downwards trending downwards channel over here, and we did a retest of the the five twenty five uh resistance level over here, which was also the fifty percent Fibonacci retracement. So with that, I think currently the surprise is currently just um consolidating sideways with support at the at the level at five oh five. Yeah, so I expect same coin actually just um to continue a bit of a consolidation uh first uh in the near term. Okay, then for Singtel, uh, Singtel, I think nothing much is still trading in this range over here, but uh, price action wise is still weak now, following the gap down over here that occurred start of November. So with that, I think possibly price could trade a bit lower to try and retest uh, 225, 226, this, uh, this support level over here again. Okay, then for sets, Okay, well, sets. Uh, I think the price action wise is still looking strong. Uh, following there was a retest of this, uh, downtrend resistance line, and after some after a few days of consolidation today, we had a a break above, uh, a new high again above two two seventy four. So with that, I think price likely to continue to trend upwards. Uh, towards the next resistance level, which is around two eighty, uh, previous swing high in August this year. Okay, then the next one will be on SIA. Okay, SIA, I think uh, a sideways after the break of this downward uh, channel over here. But uh, I would think looking from the current price action, looks like it's still 
likely to trade in a sideways fashion between this 610 level as well as 630. So I think, yeah, for near term, we still like to see some form of consolidation in a bit. Okay, then for CT development looks like, I think we could see some form of rebound uh, in the short term. Uh, price is still forming low, higher, lower highs as well as lower lows, but there's some uh, bullish divergence taking place for after the formation of the, the lower low uh, just last week. Um, yeah, so I think as long as hold these lows, we are likely to see uh, maybe the price kind of uh, stabilize and range trade uh, yeah, with the resistance at the 640s level over here, we, we had this swing high as well as this uh, downtrend resistance line. Okay, then for Yangtzejiang shipbuilding, I think uh, price is still finding resistance along this downtrend resistance line. Uh, then recently we also broke down, we also broke down a higher low formation, so at least up, uh, short term uptrend support line. So with that, I think price, looking at price action wise, is still likely to be weak. I think uh, perhaps could see a retest of 142, this support over here, and maybe do a bit of a range consolidation for now first. Okay, then moving on to some uh, Hong Kong counters. 3032, uh, HSI Management Tech Index ETF. Okay, I think for this likely to, uh, in my opinion, it looks like it's trending, uh, trading in this rising wedge formation for now. So I think uh, potentially we could see maybe price test towards the do a retest of 410 over here again before I meet some resistance. Okay, then for Tencent, I think uh put I think Tencent uh put there's a potential for a uh, breakout over here of this downtrend resistance line. So uh price action wise we're forming uh, a nice uh higher highs and higher lows recently, as well as we also broke out of this 315 level uh recently following this um uh, inverted head and shoulders formation over here. There was a retest, uh there was made with support today. So that looks pretty good, I think. Uh, with a breakout over here, potentially you could see maybe price um go higher to test uh towards three four three forty four yeah, three forty four level again in the near term. Then next one for Alibaba. Alibaba looks uh not a little more, a little bit more bearish compared to to. Tencent is still forming lower highs, lower lows. And following earnings release, we had this gap down over here. So this was a bit we we actually broke below the the lows of this year. So with that, I think continues to look bearish. Yeah, but for now, uh, still unable to comment much on the outlook ahead since that still with this gap down and yeah, still looks like I still need more candles, uh, to form. But yeah, it's still looking uh, quite bearish for now. And then next up for Capital Corp. Okay, Capital Corp, I think uh currently is potentially they will try to break out of this downtrend channel over here. Uh price has traded mostly in a range fashion over here, 16620 to about six, close to 650. Uh positive is that it looks like it's trying to it has formed some higher lows along the way. So I think with a as long uh there's a potential breakout 650, price will continue to trade higher to test uh higher levels like between 665 as well as 6 um 680 again. Okay, then next up for Wilma. Okay, for Wilma, I think uh likely there's still some resistance ahead. We're still trading in this down down uh downwards trade. Uh, down downtrend channel over here. There's a uh, some resistance at three seventy level, which was, uh, which was a break, uh, breakdown and there's a retest which made resistance. So, yeah, I'm expecting resistance at three seventy or three seventy five still, uh, in the near term for me.
Okay, then for Hong Kong land, Hong Kong land looks like I think some consolidation taking place after a breakdown, but price has tested the support, a uh, previous support around three thirteen. Um, then did a rebound, a retest of the three forty previous support breakdown made resistance. Currently looks like uh we need a bit of a green trading consolidation first. Yeah, in the near term for Hong Kong land. Then for uh Jardin. I think for Jardin is a bit similar as well. Still uh just range trading for now. So yeah, I think for near term we are likely to see still some consolidation ahead. Uh, next will be BYD. Okay, for BYD is also currently I think it's just range trading still uh taking place since end of August over here. Yeah, so I think still unchanged in terms of the trend. Yeah, I think likely you still see some consolidation hit for for BYD. Okay, then as for as for SIA engineering, I think uh there has been a rebound after the price tested this 224 again and uh may should recover back above this 230 breakdown level. Uh looks like there was a retest and price held over here. So that looks uh good. Uh potentially we could see another uh a further bounce upwards to test this resistance at around close to 240 again. Then we we just continue a bit of a range pattern over. Uh, in the near term. Hey, then, uh, do you think C trim is over so? I'm okay, currently looking at the, the RSI, yeah, it has been quite near the oversold region. So yeah, it's a bit oversold, but I think uh for now it still looks the there's still no very bullish pattern over here. Uh price is still holding at the 10, 0.107 level, but we have been forming lower highs in this down downwards trending channel. So yeah, things still looks bearish unless we see a breakout above this uh immediate downtrend channel as well as this uh this the next resistance will be this downtrend resistance line. Yeah, but for now we haven't seen any of those signs here. Okay, then next one will be UOL. Okay, UOL, I think, I think that recently we had a retest of the prior support breakdown on 635, and then we did a back test of the recent resistance breakout six, uh, 610. With that, I think uh, possibly it could move in a bit of a range for now, but uh, the positive is that uh, starting to form higher lows and higher highs. Uh, Looks like uh, an end, an end to this uh, downtrend stretch over here. Yeah, so possibly a short, a very slow uh, upwards trending uh, pattern for UAL. Okay, then okay, for top group, I think. Um, Looks like a range for now. Uh, after tested the support over here, uh, twenty cents again. Then, uh, did it went back up to test twenty three cents previous support breakdown. So with that, I think some range consolidation first. Uh, but I think if it continues to hold higher low, we see uh twenty twenty one and a half cents level. Potentially, we could see maybe price try to break out. Uh, above this twenty three cent resistance, which could bring uh, the price up to test uh, closer to about 20, 24 and a half to about 25 cents uh, next resistance level. Okay, then I'll answer the last one on uh, Marco Polo Marine. Okay, Marco Polo Marine, I think currently uh, there was a possible consolidation over here in, in this wedge over here, but uh, today looks like another retest of this 0.054 level. 
um, yeah, so there's slightly some resistance still at this level, but uh, if let's say the price can hold a higher low along the way over here, then there's positive, there's a potential um there's potential of price to break over this resistance to try and test some higher levels like uh, 0 0.058 or the swing high this year at 0 0.060 again for Marco Polo. So I think that's uh that's all for me for TA. I'll pass pass back the time to Paul if you have uh for if you have, there's any other questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure why the camera doesn't work, but but any anyway, thanks everyone. So, so sorry if we uh, oh sorry it works. Okay, uh, sorry if we can't uh, answer every question. We try to end it by one. Uh, but we will try and post some of the questions that we, we didn't answer. Uh, hopefully, uh, in the community in the P three community. Uh, chat so uh, again thanks everyone for your time and hope to see you again next week and uh, thanks for all your questions and i hope everyone have a good week ahead thank you everybody